We are live streaming now. Um, I just want to say hi to everybody who's come in early and is joining us on YouTube Live. Uh, this is, I think, the fifth webinar we're having as part of our Endowers Live. Um, it's a new world out there. Um, there's a lot of pain and suffering and difficulties. Um, we have introduced circuit breakers in Singapore here to limit the spread of the COVID virus. Um, and we want to support that. So we uh, you know, discussed quite a lot about whether to cancel the webinar, but uh, we came up with a brilliant idea, which is uh, to have Lou and I, um, who's here with us, um, in a completely different room, uh, different floor, um, and uh, share our thoughts across uh, Zoom and YouTube today. So um, before we begin, uh, I want to just say hi to everybody and introduce myself first, and then we'll move on to Lou, my good friend, um, who's a founder of the 1M65 movement and is a big proponent of investing your CPF wisely um, and using your CPF to grow your wealth. Um, uh, using your CPF savings. Um, first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Ree. I'm the Chief Investment Officer and Chairman at Indawas. Uh, Indawas, as most people already know, is a uh, cutting edge wealth tech platform uh, that allows you to seamlessly invest uh, your wealth and savings. It is the first and only digital advisor for CPF investing. Um, so we espouse um, investing your CPF wisely uh, in globally diversified, low-cost portfolios. Um, but people also forget that we have access to investing in SRS and also uh, your cash savings. Uh, we have services for high net worth individuals. Um, so we are a general overall uh, wealth platform uh, with the special um, service that is the first and only digital advice that we give. So before we begin, um, I wanted to show you this slide of the pigeonhole. So today we're going to change things a little bit and take some Q&A um, because I know a lot of the audience uh, want to hear from Lou in particular. You're, you're probably sick of me already um, because I've been doing this a few times. Uh, so And you'll have plenty of opportunities to ask me questions later, but I would love to take this opportunity to pick Lou's brain and our audience, whether it's in Dallas or Lou's fan club, or you know, just people are generally interested in investing their CPF, or how to use CPF effectively to prepare for their retirement, um, and that, you know, in order to secure their financial future. I think you know a lot of questions exist out there. So um, we have this pigeonhole. Please go into it. It's 4M65. Um, you can scan the QR code or type it into your mobile phone or your laptop. Uh, go in there and then you will have, uh, we'll have questions. So this is a screen that we have of the questions that are already in, in the funnel. Um, and then on that, you can actually vote. So you can vote up questions that you really like that, and the ones that are, get to the top will be the ones that we give priority to in terms of answering. So please get in there and start uh, doing that so that we can get started. Um, sorry, that was the wrong slide. Uh, on the right side is a sign up for next week's webinar. We have the Woke Salary Man, a uh, very famous, um, you know, uh, blogger, uh, wonderful artwork. Uh, Rui Ming, who is the co-founder, will be joining our personal finance lead, Cheng Xi, um, to do a fast free investing for beginners, um, targeted for everybody, um, you know, millennials all the way to older age, but anybody who's interested in fast free investing. Um, and uh, please join us at the same time next week. And then the final thing I want to just shout out to Lou's Telegram channel. Um, it's growing exponentially, and Lou's a very busy, busy man with a lot of businesses and external stuff, but he's, he's there in the Telegram channel, uh, chatting with his audience, trying to help people um, with advice um, on how to manage their CPF, um, personal finance, you know, just sharing views about investing. I'm in that channel as well. Uh, although I'm a pretty quiet, quiet, quiet person in that channel, right, Lou? Yep. <laughs> so so uh, that's where we are. Um, so, you know, the social distancing, uh, we're keeping to that. Uh, Indaos is committed to the government's uh, new rules and regulations. Uh, we are classified as an essential business providing financial advice. Um, so our office is uh, still open. 
but we actually have nobody working here or telecommuting, telecommuting because that's the capabilities that we have. And today we're joined um, by my dear good friend, uh, Lou, um, who's joined us. And um, maybe Lou, why don't we start off by, um, well, thanks for joining, uh, first of all. And then, you know, why don't you just give, yourself, give a quick introduction of yourself before we kick off? Well, thanks, Sam. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, this is my second time since the since uh, the COVID nineteen um, issue picked up in Singapore to do an online um, seminar or webinar. Um, I appreciate this time. Actually, it's uh, it's better. You know, uh, you can you can reach out to more people and uh, don't trouble so many people, and you can listen to this at the comfort of your of your bedroom or your house. So. Um, the simple introduction, some of you all might know me, some of you all don't. So my name is Lou. I'm a I'm an ordinary sorry, just, sorry to interrupt Lou. If you can speak a little bit louder is the request. Yeah. Uh okay. As loud as you is, can. Yeah, maybe put it closer. Does it sound does it sound better right now? Um a yep, bit louder? A little bit, a little bit better. Any feedback? Good. Yes, no? Yeah. Okay. A bit of a lag, so yeah. Just talk loud and let's keep going. Okay. So thanks everybody for for tuning in. My name is Lou. I'm a very ordinary Singaporean with a extraordinary investment strategy uh, called One M Six Five. And in this in this strategy, I hope to make more Singaporeans families millionaire or even multi millionaire. I've been doing this uh, promoting the use of your CPF uh, as a get rich tool. Uh, for close to four years and I've reached out and spoken to tens of thousands of Singaporeans and I've written widely in this field of uh, of finance, of personal finance and I this is my 75th talk, okay, uh, 75th talk to, uh, over the years uh, in reaching out to people. So I hope that uh, today uh, will be more a, will be more like a fireside chat uh, for for you uh, also to ask me questions, um, and I hope to be able to share with you not just about one M sixty five, but also the recently developed four M sixty five as well. Okay, so over to you, Sam. Yep, thank you so much, Lou. Uh, there is still feedback that it's a little bit soft, so if you can speak as loud as you can, that's great. Um, it's soft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm speaking right beside the speaker. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we'll get going. Uh, two other things is a sign up offer, uh, a discount voucher for people who want to sign up to endow us. Also, a shout out to our friends at Seedly, who's a collaborator and good friend of Lou and I uh, and endow us. And if you want to see reviews of endow us, which is helpful, or if you have any questions, um, today we'll answer today's questions. But any other questions that you may have, uh, we will uh, try to answer them as best as we can. Okay, and uh, so Lou, I think, you know, just uh, as we kick off, um, you know, uh, Lou is, uh, as, I said, as I mentioned, a dear friend, advisor, partner in the fight to level the playing field in investing in Singapore. Um, also, um, you know, he's been a speaker at CPF events. Um, maybe you can share your journey first um, what has been your own experience of investing? Um, we'll, we'll go into more detail later. Maybe, some, you know, just focus on the basic concepts about what kind of an investor you are, uh, what your philosophy is when it comes to investing your money and your CPF, and what you think is meant by investing well. Okay. So, uh, thanks, Sam. I think that's a very, in the light of the recent market volatility and crashes and swings and things like that, I think this question has become more important. Now. What what an invest, investor are you? So for me, I realized that I'm really a very risk averse investor. I don't like to I don't like to to invest in something that I have no confidence in. I like to invest in something I know in the long run will make money and make a lot of money for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to punt. I don't like to speculate. Um, I am a I'm a, in in Hokkien we say a pao jia. No, I like to invest in something that I know is a sure win. So, so in that sense, you know, I've been I've been investing over my years since uh, in my twenties. Lost a lot of money in 1997 financial crisis, Asia financial crisis. 
Then I got smarter. I met a good financial mentor who had taught me the the real fundamentals of investment. And I and I've since then um, you know strengthened my financial muscles and guts and wisdom. And I profited from two thousand and eight financial uh, global financial crisis, and then made more money in the in the Europe debt crisis uh, of two thousand and twelve, and then the China stock market crash in two thousand fifteen. I hope in one or two years' time, I'll be able to tell you that I have made a lot of money out of this uh, COVID nineteen uh, uh, COVID crisis as well. So, so but that's essentially who I am. You know, I'm a risk averse, long term, uh, and uh, and I like to make money on crashes. Okay, so right. over to you. Sam. Yeah. So, um, so those are really good learnings. Um, I think you know you are one of the more lucky ones uh, in terms of being able to find a mentor and, you know, uh, developing an investment philosophy that you've been able to implement very systematically and in a disciplined manner. And so that has led to success for you. But I was also curious, you know, and many people will probably ask, um, do you actually pick stocks as well? Do you trade? Uh, do you try to time the market like some of the other people? You know, we've all done it at some point. Um, I'm just, you know, you, you mentioned it briefly but about your failures in the past, but uh, do you do any of those things? Um, and, you know, how has that experience been? What are your thoughts about things like that? No, that's a very good question. Um, I try not to pick stock, but occasionally I'm forced by certain, certain circumstances to pick stock. Uh, and whenever I do that, I lose money. I don't know why. Um, and it's something I don't like do, uh, and I, I don't like to do. Mm. Um, recently, uh, as a market crash, uh, you know, I've got my SRS. I thought the SRS I can't, I can put into the S and P 500, which is my favorite fund. Um, so I put some into Singapore Airlines, and I think I'm going to lose money there. So as a market crash, I put some into it, uh, and unfortunately, Singapore Airlines have uh, almost went into uh, financial uh, difficulty. So, 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 so as a rule of thumb, whenever I pick stock, I, 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 I lose money. So I, I don't like to do that. Uh, just for everybody's information, I was just told after I pick uh, SIA, um, I, I put money SIA with my SRS. Uh, Sam told me that, why didn't you put uh, SRS into S&P 500? I said, there's no way I can do that. Well, he, he told me that endowers can do that. So uh, it's, it's a pity he told me too late, yes. Yeah, sorry, but I like to call. invest... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I like to invest in something that has longevity, yeah. something that has can stand the test of time. Um, in fact, yesterday I've uh, put you know a very large sum uh, into the S and P five hundred um, and uh, and treasury bond as well. So uh, that I've confident that you know that will stand the test of time. Yes. Yeah. So so yeah. So that's that's my experience, and I I really really encourage everybody uh, not to pick stock. Um, I think it's okay to try the time generally in the market to buy on crashes, uh, but to be able to buy at the low sell and a high buy and a low sell and a high buy and a low sell, I I think that's very difficult. I would almost say that uh, that's near impossible. Mm, yeah. So we, it's something that we always say as well. I mean, timing the market is always, you know, everybody tries to be a hero and tries to, they think that they have something that other people don't have. You know, they either have great timing or they have great information or they see things that other people don't. And that's, I think, the biggest kind of mistake we make as a human being. Um, and it's been proven time and time again that timing the market is not a successful strategy. Um, but, you know, what you mentioned just now, though, is very relevant, which is that, you know, when the market comes off, you know, if you have um, spare, um, you know, capacity, to put more money to work, uh, especially on the way down. Um, I think that's just a very successful strategy. And that's been, that's worked for you in the past, right? Maybe you can share, you know, some thoughts about the current situation and how can we can implement that as the market comes down um, and how you succeeded in the past in achieving that. Okay. So I think it is very important first to establish what we call a financial safety net that that is, uh, I've written about an article recently on it that you can read it in uh, dollars and cents if you Google my name. But really, an anchor um, investment portfolio that will stand the test of time, meaning that, you know, whatever happens unless a nuclear bomb explodes in Singapore, this portfolio, which is uh, what I call 1M65, uh, which is anchored on CPF, 
if you have that, you know, you know that even if you lose every investment out there in the stock market, this money will still be safe. It will help you maintain uh, a peace of mind in investment. And I think some of you or most of you might know real investment is less of a intellectual experience, but a emotional skill. So if you cannot regulate your emotional uh, well-being, you cannot invest well. Right? The people who invest very well are people who are secured emotionally. Whenever the market goes up or down, they have no feelings about it now. So that's essentially what I think is important as the first step. And the second step is in times like this, once you establish a financial safety net, in my case, it's in a CPF, then whatever cash I have, first of all, I set aside something for a rainy day. Now, this word rainy day has changed. I've changed my concept. This word financial rainy day has to change because I think we need to set ourselves aside for a financial, not rainy day, not a rainy day, but a financial storm. So it is very important for us to set aside a money. I used to think it's three to six months. Uh, I think it's safer to do uh, six to nine months or even beyond of living expenses. Now, this time around, had the government not stepped in to save the economy, I think a lot of people would be jobless and a lot of people would have uh, run into severe financial difficulty. Mm. So... Now, I, I personally think that uh, six to nine months, uh, 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 a kitty is important for you to set aside. With the rest of the money, I think what you can do is cut up into you know 10 or 15 pieces as the market crash. And there's no right or wrong. I, I cannot tell you what you should do, but what I do. As the market crash beyond 25, 30%, you buy on the crash. Uh -huh. If it rebound, I don't buy anything, right? So I only like to buy S&P 500. Uh, recently, I also added to my portfolio some bonds, uh, treasury bonds. So it becomes a balanced portfolio. Uh -huh. So as it goes down, I, I buy on a crash. Any rebounds, I just step aside and wait, right? right. And I sleep well at night, you know. I, I think it will make me uh, quite a lot of money in the long run. Uh, it has proven uh, to, to do well. So, so I think it is something that I... I, I do a, I do right now in this thing. And I think uh, it is the right strategy uh, that we can take advantage of this. Mm. So, um, so Sam, I assume that we'll be talking about this crisis uh, uh, in, in more depth later, or do I talk about yeah, it right now? No, 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 we can talk about that later. But um, you know, and this is a chart that I wanted to share with everybody. And this is what Lou is referring to is that, you know, whenever there is a crisis, it is an opportunity for us. And the reason is because the market is always skewed positively on the way up because it's a growth as a class uh, because it's you know the market is seeding out the best companies uh, that perform the best over the long term um, so there is a positive skew and that's why the annualized return um, of lose favorite fund index fund uh, s p 500 uh, is has generated nine percent over a very very long period post-war every single year despite the crash uh, that occurred in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s and now as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can come, we, rather than come back to it, then maybe you can, uh, you know, comment on that, on the current crisis a little bit more, and then we move on to the CPF piece after that. Maybe that would be good. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think this is the first time I'm going to make this judgment now that the, the crisis have, have uh, the financial crash and crisis have lasted for probably a month or so. I think it's very interesting phenomena. Now, first of all, this is by no means, uh, uh, by no means a, 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 a ordinary crash because this one is a crash that actually has uh, incurred, uh, this crash has caused by if a, a health crisis that has a lot of life and death. So in short, this is a big crisis in terms of economic impact. This in terms of unemployment across the world it far exceeds uh, anything that we've seen since the Great Depression. Now, this economic impact will far exceed that of the Great Recession. And we're already seeing it. But very interestingly, this financial impact in terms of the stock market is very, very muted compared to that of the Great Financial Crisis or even that of the Asia Financial Crisis or the tech bubble burst. 
the crash is very much uh, very much less. And while it comes down rapidly, it comes down frighteningly, and it, it couples with a, a lot of deaths. But in terms of impact, it's actually very much less than that of the Great Recession of 2008, which that those days uh, it crashed by more than uh, 50%. So this time around, we're looking at 30% max, no, sorry, 25, 30%, and that's it. The government across the world, from the US to Singapore, UK, every established country has thrown in a whole kitchen sink of monetary and fiscal policy to save the economy. And I think that has really cushioned the impact of the financial uh, markets. Now, will it crash further? Maybe there'll be some, there'll be a lot of volatility. Um, the, and, and I think this will go on, but, but I think this time around, we actually see a big divergence between the economic impact and the financial market impact. And, and I think the one that stand in a gap happened to be the government's, uh, uh rescue packages that have been coming out from all countries. So now what do we do in times like this, right? Go back to basics. I think go back to basics. The basics will still be stay invested. Stay invested for a long time. Stay and invest is something that stand the test of time. And there are very few things that stand the test of time. Okay. There's only a globally financial diversified index, uh, like the S&P 500. STI is not a globally diversified index. Okay. And we'll talk about that later, but the S&P 500 or an equivalent, I think, um, I think endowers also have, uh, have dimension funds and some other some other global funds. Coup- couple that with some bonds, I think will be good as a cushioning. So I think that's still the way to go. Buy on crashes, spread out, do a regular savings plan or so on. I think we'll all do very well if we stick to basic uh, basic principles. So that's, I think, what we should do. It's no surprises. It is something very boring, but you know what? It is boring that usually makes the most money. Yeah. So I'm just going to put this chart up here because, oh, did we disappear? I think we are. We should be here. Hold on. Just one second. Okay, you open me up again. Um, and then share the screen. Okay. So um, I can share this screen, which is... Uh, the worst case scenarios. And this is a list of all the worst case outcomes in markets. And as Lou highlighted, the worst outcome obviously is the 1929-30s Great Depression. Um, In 2008-9, the great global financial crisis, uh, we had a 57% fall. This is S&P 500 once again as a standard benchmark index. And the worst uh, level at which we fell from February to March uh, was 33.9% peak to trough, um, and it only took less than, less than a month, obviously, uh, to get there. We've had a bit of a bounce, but, uh, you know, that's that's the magnitude of the fall, and that's why Lou says it's not as bad as uh, 2008. And also, I wrote an article about 1974, how Barton Biggs, my uh, previous uh, Morgan Stanley Investment Management, um, in, in, you know, founder, basically, um, talked about how 1974 was, 73-4 was one of the worst um, periods and it's in many ways very similar because it was an external shock. It was an oil embargo, massive oil prices, U.S. dollar dislocation because it left the Bretton Woods system, and um, you know Nixon was impeached and resigned. You know for the U.S. it was massive external shocks that couldn't have been predicted, and the market at that time uh, fell 48 percent. So I think one thing, one question that obviously people will have, Lou, is you know. Is, is this going to go down again? And would that be the opportunity to pick up a uh, big time? Or, I mean, it, or do we go back into the market now and start um, investing slowly uh, right here? So I think that's a very good question. Now, I would, I would say that you know, if I know the future, you know, I, I, if I know the future, I would have been God or something like that, which, yeah. which I'm not, right? So you here talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But I think it's important for us to, to instead of trying to predict the future, and it's really very difficult because, um, you know, Absolutely. suddenly uh, there are a lot of variables that are changing by the day, mm. right? So, um, while 
for example, right, at one point of time, our infection rate in Singapore was going down uh, and suddenly it hits the uh, workers' dormitories and workers' dormitories and also the old folks' uh, homes and things like that. Uh, and it starts to pick up and it's picking up rapidly and then the government has to lock down the whole country. Yeah. Now, these are changing by the day, right? In in US right now, one two days ago, the New York mayor came out and announced, oh, I think the worst is behind us and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday, suddenly, the US deaths hit the record high of near 2,000. Yeah. And suddenly, they say the worst is uh, yet to be, right? So, everything is changing by the day. So, you cannot immerse yourself into this. In fact, I would suggest everybody to switch off their Facebook and their news feed and just step back, right? And step back and not market, at this. Right? Related to market. Mm not switch. let not let your emotions be affected and they probably live happier right so go down and spend time go out and spend time walking in the park spend time with your children some of you have not spent enough time with your children and your wife for a long time this is the best time to do it yep. and then take a peek at the stock market once a day or twice a day mm -hmm. just for a few minutes and just see where is it right now right and if the market is right it crashed you know, I told you um, that I would suggest cutting out your your available funds for maybe 10 to 15 pieces. If it crashes big, throw in one piece and walk away and go back to your life, right? Yeah. So I think I think that's probably the safe thing to do. I don't know how the market will go higher or lower. I really can't predict. I, I tried, you know, in this uh, time to take a look. Then I realized that well, it's really too difficult to, to predict at this time. Yeah. And... Now, will the economy go for the worst before it comes better? I think so. I probably can predict the economy better than I can predict the stock market. Yeah. So now, will the stock market move in the same same uh, uh, direction and the same magnitude as the stock market? Uh, as the, Sorry, the, will the stock market move in the same magnitude as the economy? It should, but it's not necessary because of all the government intervention. Mm. So... I think we have to we have to be ready with uh, with with a divergent of the stock market and the, the real economy, yep. um, and and put enough uh, uh, put enough arsenal and spread out and just buy on the crashes. And meanwhile, do not uh, exclude the possibility that in the we call it the the opposite of Wall Street is Main Street, which is in the real world there are going to be more financial challenges. And I think you got to prepare yourself for that as well, right? Upskill yourself, change to a new business style, yeah. uh, get used to webinars like this, go yeah. online, go e-commerce, go transform your buying style, whatever. just adjust to the new world. Yeah. And I think uh, that's probably what we should do to spend enough time uh, in the real world and the financial world. Yeah. It's interesting because um, we, we shared this study that we did of all the recessions and the period from peak to trough falls in all of those 12 massive U.S. recessions, some of it actually came before the recession. Sometimes it came between, in, in, during the recession. And sometimes the biggest falls actually happened almost after the recession or part of the recession and the aftermath of it. So we don't know when that actual correction comes um, when we're investing. And I think to Lou's point, it's very difficult to know for sure uh, when the market will fall the most and you know how that will do. Um, also, I think you know somebody was asking me what's like the advice. <laughs> I think Sheng Shi wanted to join us. <laughs> Just putting the volumes up. Uh, I think we got requests to put the volumes up even more. Um, so I think you know I was saying that it is a time when it's easy to be fearful, right? Um, it's fearful. It's you know difficult and it's fearful because we're worried about our health. Worried about you know um, circumstances that our loved ones are in or our friends are in you know overseas or in Singapore, uh, but even when we look at the market, it's very it's very easy to be very fearful. And I think as human beings, when we're fearful, we make bad choices, um, whether it's flight or fight or freeze, whatever those natural human reactions are to fear. I don't think we make the best choices uh, when we are fearful, especially when it comes to investing. Uh, so I think it's really important, uh, Lou, thanks for that. I think it's really important, uh, as Lou said, to be very thoughtful about your planning, um, to be long-term in focus, and be methodical in your execution uh, on the way down and on the way up. So we're going to shift the conversation a little bit, Lou. Um, 
you're known as Mr. CPF, right? <laughs> it, um, Lou, as, as many people know, has been serving the community and all the CPF members by giving regular talks. How many talks have you done now? 75th talk today. 70, 75th, 75 yes. talks to broad communities, both young and old, uh, about how to invest well um, and to grow well through your CPF. Uh, the 1M65 movement has been, you know, you started that how long ago now? It's been... 2015. 2015. So, wow. Yes. Five years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> five years. Um, and Lou began as a way to uh, introduce and educate people to the awareness, you know, financial literacy, um, to let people know that there is, it is possible to use your CPF to build wealth. Uh, so I think that was really something new at the time. Uh, but Lou, for those that don't know you well, um, the very few, do you mind sharing your journey of how you became Mr. CPF and, you know, what are some of the learnings, some of your thoughts about, you know, your experiences, um, giving these talks and sharing your ideas and sharing your experiences? Okay. And Is this you can use your slides at any point yes, in time. Yes, yeah. Okay. So, so maybe while uh, Sam adjusts my slides, first of all, the, the name Mr. CPF was not given by myself. Uh, and in, in the early days of 2015 and 16, if you're called Mr. CPF, people throw stones at you because those days the CPF doesn't have that good uh, uh, a name in the, in the country. Everybody thinks that CPF is out there to, to con your money and CPF is out there to, to take withhold money from you so that you don't have a good retirement, that kind of thing. I think those days are over and I think Singaporeans are a lot more mature right now. Um, so so I've, I think a lot more people right now are beginning to trust that CPF is actually a very good uh, get rich too is a good wealth building machine, and I spent you know at last five years um, educating uh, people how to not be mistaken by the naysayers. Uh, this uh, this CPF is a good uh, money making machine. I have a very a bridge uh, summarized version of some of my slides. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about uh, very quickly on one M six five, and then I spend more time on four M six five. Some of my one M six five fans in uh, I think they are close to. Uh, three, 3, two, close like to 3,000 or uh, 2,008 uh, fans right now. Um, but not everybody has heard my 4M65. They read some articles. Mm. Maybe we'll just go through very quickly on slides. Okay, sure. so so um, first, first uh, and foremost, I do not uh, work for the CPF and neither do I work for the government. Uh, and I've told you that I built my financial safety net um, with a powerful tool called uh, 1M65. Now, 1M65 is very simply. Next slide, please. Okay, he, it takes advantage of the fact that the CPF actually gives you a very high return rate. In the ordinary account, it gives you 2.5%. And then the special account and the MediSafe account actually gives you 4 to 6% return, right? So it's 4%. And after that, the, an extra percent for the first 60,000. And then when you reach 55 or so, they give one extra percent. So it's 4 to 6% return. It's incredibly high. And this power compounding uh, will help you build up uh, a big, uh, let your, your, your CPF snowball from a small little ball to a big, huge ball. Uh, and if you can take advantage of it well. Okay, next. Yep. So when I was uh, around 30 years old, I figured out this uh, magic formula that if my wife and I each would have put $130,000 into our special account, MediSafe account, which by then, at that point in time, was the, the CPF minimum sum. Today is rebranded as the FRS, uh, full retirement sum. If I were to put around 130,000 inside and let it compound over 35 years uh, to 65 years old, so each of us will exceed around half a million dollars in our special account and MediSafe account. And that will add, both add together will, will give us a million dollars. Now take note, it says this, it says that if at 30 years old, we can put in $130,000 each into our special account, MediSafe account, we do not need to work anymore from 30 years old or to 65 and you have a million dollars. That's incredible. Now for some of you all, you say, oh man, 30 years old, 130,000, that's impossible. Uh, you know, 130,000 is impossible. You know, I've got this commitment, that commitment, you know, I've got this lifestyle to maintain. You know what? I used to think that $130,000 is very difficult. Now, with my 1M65 group, 
there are 2,008 to 3,000 people inside. There are quite a few people who have came to me and just said, I fit $181,000 alone already at the age of 30 years old or 30, 31, 32. So they have outdone me and they will do much better than me in, in, the, in the CPF journey. So the question really is, if this assumption that I stop working at 30 years old and I'll still have a million dollars, what happens if we continue to work? Next slide, please. Okay, so because my wife and I continue to work and we are working in jobs that we like and we, are, we have a passion on, so we work very hard. You know what? By 45 years old, instead of waiting to 65 years old, by 45 years old, we actually cross a million dollars in our CPF, right? A million dollars in our CPF at 45 years old. So it's not 1M65, but it's 1M45. Now, again, as I said, 1M45, you know, I recently get more and more people telling me, no big deal. I'm going to hit it 1M39, 1M38, that kind of thing. So uh, just to let you know that, and they are ordinary people, ordinary Singaporeans. And some of you said, oh, just because they are rich. No, they're not. They're extremely frugal, extremely hardworking, stay in humble houses, humble HDB. They don't drive a car. They live very frugal life and they became millionaire at a very young age. Okay, I'm considered an ordinary uh, mil uh, millionaire at 45 or so then. So next slide, please. So the question really is, so I'm now 48 years old. So I was uh, I was uh, 45 years old when we crossed uh, $1 million. So how much is our CPF right now? My CPF right now, $1.34 million. That's me and my wife. We have excluded uh, all the housing uh, investments. Uh, uh, all the housing uh, purchase uh, mortgages and things like that. So $1.34 million, it compounds rapidly. Why is it so? Because this, the power compounding moves like this. In the early days, it's a very flat increase. And then as it goes, as, a, as the time goes up, it bends and goes up. And this is what we call exponential increase. So the question really is, next slide, please. What will we become at 65? What will our CPF account become at 65? And the answer is, I got, first of all, because of COVID-19, I stay in Singapore. I used to travel a lot. I've got nothing better to do. I did a lot of calculation. I worked on a spreadsheet. And I came out with a number, $3.4 million. I didn't believe it. So what I did was I enrolled the help of a lot of volunteers from 1M65 Movement. A total of about 14, 14 people volunteered to help me. Each of them Took a, take a look at my spreadsheet. Many of them recalculated it uh, from scratch and they all come up with figures roughly this. Now, how do you get three or $4 million as a couple? Very simply, it's because we continue work. And do we need a high salary? Well, you need at least $6,000 uh, uh, monthly. And we have, uh, we have assumed that, you know, my current, uh, my current, my current uh, investments and all this will, will, will just, we'll just uh, let it run, okay? And then we have our three for four million dollars. That's that's a lot of money for retirement, okay? By simply staying in the job and keep working. Nothing much more, right? You don't need a lot of wisdom. You don't need a lot uh, to do uh, risky things. Just keep, uh, just keep working. And the real secret really is that you need to, you need to build up your financial safety net when you're young. Next, please. Now, the question is this. I've assumed that all my ordinary account will compound at 2.5%. But what if, now something has changed over the last few months. I found this company called Endowers. Now, I'm not trying to do, I don't, I don't own any share in Endowers. I don't get a fee from them. The, the, the best they've done is that um, the Sam has bought me a char siu rice uh, that's waiting for me downstairs. I don't think it costs a lot of money. I haven't eaten it yet. So. And I haven't eaten it yet, right? So... <laughs> It's waiting for you. It's getting cold. But what if I what if I invest yeah. my money in an ordinary account in S&P 500, which was never possible until recently. I don't know what Sam did to convince uh, CPF to allow members to go through them to invest in S&P 500. And the fees are quite low. So this opened up a new possibility right now. If I have invested all my ordinary, ordinary account, especially in a downtime like this, okay, 
uh, into my S&P 500 and just let it compound at a rate of 7% or so, how much will my 3.4 million grow to when I'm 65? Let's take a look at the figure. Oops, sorry, one, one. There you go. It will explode into a phenomenal $5 million, right? What do you need to do? You just need to put money in S&P 500 and leave it there and ignore it and go on with your life, right? You don't need to try to time the market. Just let it invest and let it compound and let it compound. The fees of endowers is fortunately quite low or else CPF will not allow them to, to let it invest. And there's one more thing you need to do is that for what I do is that I let my housing mortgage be paid in cash. Okay. First of all, I still stay in HDB flat despite me uh, being a millionaire. I still stay in a HDB flat. I, I do not let my, my housing mortgage touch my CPF. Because why? Because of CPF gives you a very high return rate of 2.5%. So I let it, I let it compound and the amount that comes out is a phenomenal sum of $5 million plus. Okay. So there are other CPF hacks as well that, that many of my 1M65 fans suggested. Some say, why don't you put my cash back uh, to return back the housing mortgages that are done. The number will grow some phenomenal number. It's very difficult to model that. And you know what? Everybody is asking me, can I have the calculator? Can I have a calculator? Can I have a spreadsheet? You know what we've done? You know, next please. Okay. Okay. So first of all. Oops, there's one more. Yeah, sorry. So first of all, 4M65 is very achievable. What you need to do, you need to stay married and stay healthy. Now, some of you ask, so for, for a couple, is 4M65, does it mean for one person is 2M65? The answer is, it's going to be more difficult to do 2M65. Why is it so? It's because when you have two persons working together, you encourage one another, you share the financial burdens or financial expenses, and your housing mortgage is also shared. So it's a lot easier when you work towards it as a couple. So for young couples, make sure you get the right wife or husband. Okay. Find someone that shares your common financial passion of frugality and hard work. Now this word stay healthy. This slide was done before the COVID-19 crisis. The word stay healthy has new meaning for all of us today. All right. You really need to stay alive. You need to stay healthy. Okay. Mm. So stay at home, please. Uh, and, and quarantine yourself. Okay. Throughout this crisis. Second of all, um, it is important for us to work very hard with, with a good income uh, for at least $6,000. Above $6,000 doesn't really matter because the CPF has a cap at $6,000. And please do not try to avoid using the CPF for your, your property mortgages. Don't buy a condo, don't buy a landed property. A lot of Singaporeans are crazy about property. I think we'll talk about that we'll come, later. Come back to that, Lou. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> so the other one is that... Um, Okay, you know, before we go sure you... to the calculator, there is one question. Um, is Mr. Lu, how is Mr. Lu teaching Mrs. Lu about 1M65? <laughs> we'll, we'll answer the question shortly. Uh, let's, let's finish. Uh, okay, okay, let's okay. finish. Let's, that's a good question, by the way. <laughs> okay, next slide, yes. Okay, sure. Now, for the, the 1M65 movement is a fully non-profit organization. And the wonderful thing is that we have a lot of passionate very seasoned financial financial um, um, enthusiasts inside. And one of them actually volunteered and did a CPF calculator as an app. So we have came out of it and uh, in this, it, the download is available in our Telegram channel. Uh, make sure you go to my Telegram channel and follow us. Uh, we'll have more and more interesting thing, interesting thing coming out when you is there that uh, you have a very good community helping you. But with this calculator, and just key in your current OA, SA, and MA, your, your date of birth and your salary and things on, and you just click a button and it will predict for you how much you'll get in, uh, when you are, mm. when you are uh, 65 years old. It's an amazing uh, development, uh, a very warm, public-spirited, and one of the anonymous uh, uh, member actually uh, uh, did this for us, and I would like to applause them. It's available in our, in our Telegram channel. So it's, uh, please go to this Telegram channel, just click follow and, uh, and you can get it, okay? So, yeah. so I think that's, so that's think the CPF. a wonderful <laughs> tool because you know, many people find the CPF and calculating your CPF very complicated. Um, so I want to do a shout out for Lou's Telegram channel. Please join it. There's a lot of conversation about investing in general, but also CPF specifically and all the CPF hacks. 
uh, that Lou shared some he shared some he wasn't able to share or well, he won't be able to share all today uh, but also you can use the CPF calculator which is wonderful um, and also you know CPF board also has a wonderful app where you can check your balances and you know download data and information and learn about your CPF so please use these tools because it's really important your CPF is one of the most important part of your uh, wealth building and um, I wanted to show you some of the okay let me come out <laughs> we did please go to um, our YouTube and listen to the seminar that we did last week um, about how we you know um, you know use CPF um, it is a huge contribution 37% of your income um, it's something that if you keep like regularly saving um, and, you know, if you keep investing for a long period, uh, then it's, you can become CPF millionaire. So these are all things that will help us um, to build our wealth um, over time. And so please use your CPF, learn about it. Uh, one thing that I wanted to maybe touch upon is these slides, which is about, you know, actually investing your CPF, because some people still don't know that you can actually invest your CPF. And Lou, you and I can just talk to a few of these things. Um, you know, obviously you have to be 18 and over, undischarged, bankrupt. Uh, it's good to keep your, I mean, they have a 20,000 rule for keeping your OA um, and only invest above that because you can get a 1% extra interest. So 2.5 becomes 3.5. And then your first 40,000 in SA gets an extra 1%, so it gets 5%. So those are wonderful rates. And, um, you know, what can you do with your CPFI through the CPFIS program? You can invest 100% into Unitrust, Singapore government bonds that Lou mentioned before, some ETFs and insurance linked products. We'll come back to that, Lou. Uh, I know you have some things to say about things like that. Um, also, 35%, um, there's a cap uh, to just purely buying stocks and then a 10% cap for gold. Um, and so I'll talk about these uh, Indawa stuff uh, later. But maybe just on this, we can hold a interesting quick fire session about what investments, Lou, that you like and which ones you don't like. So I'm going to quickly um, shout out a asset class and then would you buy and do you like it or you don't like it and you won't buy. And so a yes, yes, no question. Simple yes, no. Number one, properties, real estate. Only for my own house. The rest, forget it. Okay, number two, equities. Equities, yes, yes, but only only in uh, S and P five hundred or globally diversified um, bond. Uh, sorry, globally diversified portfolio. Yeah. Index. Bond. Yes, I do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This one. Only treasury bond. bonds, not corporate bonds. <laughs> okay, so there is a place to be had for corporate bonds, but Lou is risk averse and doesn't like corporate bonds. Um, and definitely not single bonds, right? A globally diversified bond portfolio might be a much better way to express that. Okay, STI versus S&P 500. <laughs> I think STI is, uh, is a straight time index. Uh, STI, I've called it a super terrible index. It's one of the worst index in the world to invest in, right? So uh, I've written an article on it. Uh, please go just Google uh, Lu Cheng Chuan STI. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I actually call it a super terrible index. Now, it is very important to note that the, the STI, during the global financial crisis of 2008, it hit a high, before it crashed, it hit a high of 3,800 points. It has since then crashed all the way down and it has never recovered for the last, uh, since 2000, for the last 14 years, uh, or sorry, 12 years or so, never, never recovered. And... And while the S&P 500 has recovered many times, right, meaning that it has not just recovered back to the original point of, 2000, of 2008, it has then grown by a few hundred percent. The SDI has times never times recovered. The peak. Yeah. It's never recovered. What it does is that it doesn't share the upside, but recently when the market crashed, the US crash and the SDI crash was almost the same magnitude. Mm. So it doesn't share the upside and it goes down in the same magnitude as the downside. And why is this so? Is because it's, it's hardly, it's very few, it's not a diversified uh, uh, index. There's only 30 shares inside. And of which the top eight, the top uh, eight companies uh, dominate about uh, 40% 40, 40 or 30% of the entire index. So it's, 
it's not a it's not index that compounds. So in short, mm. I seriously discourage. There are many people are against me in this. I put my foot down. I seriously discourage this. I learn it hard way. I've put a huge amount in the in the STI during the two thousand financial crisis, and fortunately, unfortunately, it doesn't it doesn't compound well. Just before a financial crisis, uh, so last year around uh, May or June, I've decided that you know a, a, a financial crisis is going to hit Singapore, uh, uh, and I actually liquidated my entire portfolio of my SPI index. I would have been a multi multi millionaire because if I put that into S and P five hundred, uh, just from that portfolio alone. alone. And just to give you a context, I guess as an investor, if I look at the STI, the biggest problem is that it is not. You know, it doesn't have the components of growth, um, and it's a very, very, as Lou said, a very, very concentrated portfolio of a very few, like 30 stocks, and it's all Singapore exposed, very domestic, X growth, um, and you know, if you want to gain exposure to equities, it really is a growth asset class. Um, so S and P 500, um, you know, one of the reasons Lou likes it and it's effective is because it is actually, you know, the best companies in the world in the U.S but they're global companies. Um, and so that's the first thing. Secondly, you know, you are always looking at, you know, picking the best companies and replacing it. So the five top 500 is always the best companies. Uh, whereas S STI components have really stayed the same for a very, very long time. Uh, also the economic growth of the global recovery um, was priced into the S&P 500 and that's why it's been able to go up so much. But as we all know, Singapore's economic growth rate has not been that high and has, you know, been very anemic um, if you look at the overall growth. So you're exposing yourself, you know, through property to Singapore GDP. You're exposing yourself to SDI, which is Singapore GDP, which is a wonderful city state, but an extremely small one. And so it's really important to be exposed to global opportunities because those are the opportunities that will give us growth assets that will give us these long-term returns. And that's why it's so important to be globally diversified in being in investing in uh, investing in equities in particular. Um, so Lou, I'm just gonna uh, move on to the next one, which is insurance linked products. Yes or no? Yes, please, thank you. Huh? Lou, yes, thank you? you. Yes, I get you. Yeah, the next one is insurance linked products. Okay, insurance link product. I'm gonna get into trouble for saying this. Uh, there's a point of time that I actually think it's a con job. <laughs> so I, what I think is that you, know, if you want to buy insurance, buy term insurance. If you want investment, invest. Don't mix both together. Yeah. Once you mix both together, the cost is very high, right? And there's a reason why insurance agent likes to sell their product very much is because. The commissions on those are very high, usually. So, uh, I've I've unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, actually um, know of many people who learn this the hard way. Uh, unfortunately, the minute once you are in, it's very really difficult to get out as well. So, I cannot tell you what you should do in the case of what I did for my when I discovered, I terminate the policy and just mm. buy term insurance. And, and for those uh, investment I want to put, I invest right. So I don't mix both together. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Um, and especially the ones that are sold here. It's very unfortunate that Singapore sells so many insurance products and people buy this insurance thinking that they're going to have full coverage. But, you know, despite buying so many insurance products, it's all investment related and single term, single premium. And therefore, the bulk of Singapore is still undercovered in terms of insurance, which is amazing. So as Lou highlighted, you should buy term coverage, critical illness, health, specific insurance, part of your insurance, but never mix the two, insurance and investment, because you get the worst of both worlds and you get ripped off with fees, right? Yeah. So, okay, next one is, uh, okay, so this is, you are a male Singaporean, Asian guy uh, with a family, white collar. Why, why don't you like properties? I mean, you, you, People in your category, your age group, uh, cannot get enough of properties and have multiple homes. Uh, what is your rationale? Can you share with the audience? And just to let you know, I'm actually looking at the questions and addressing some of them, and I'll return to the other ones uh, later. So I'm answering, asking questions that are related to some of the questions that are coming up on Pigeonhole. 
Okay. There was a time, there was a time when the Singapore property market is a good investment. And that's because that's probably in from the year, you know, since uh, independence to about um, year 2000 uh, and I don't know, um, maybe about 10 years ago. Uh, that's because our economy then was rising rapidly. Our growth rate then was, you know, 7, 8, sometimes even 10% a year. And that's why the property market will rise in, in, in tandem with the economic growth. What drives property market is very simply, number one, population growth, and number two, uh, you have got economic growth, right? Couple with that with a, with, a, with a constrained supply market, yes, you've got phenomenal growth. But those days are over. The Singapore economy has been growing very slowly for the last 10 years. And the property, uh, the population growth is very, is very little. I have three kids and I think I'm double the national growth rate. And um, we don't like, as Singaporeans, we don't like foreigners to come in. In We we let uh, in 2000, before 2014 or 15 elections, you know, sorry, 2000, uh, sorry, at 2011, uh, uh, because we let so many uh, foreigners to come in, in the elections, you know, many Singaporeans voted, um, uh, voted against the PAP and, we have lost the minister and the two ministers of state and one GRC. So in short, um, you know, the government has tightened the control of uh, immigrants coming in. Therefore, we don't have much population growth. So, so if you ask any property agents and property experts, uh, over the last 10 years, the property market has been quite, you know, disappointing. And right now, there are many people who, goes, uh, who actually uh, would have actually who actually gain more money have they leave their money in the CPF, which have actually compounds at 2.5%. Because a lot of property right now doesn't even compound at 2.5%. So the property market today is not the same as what it used to be. And that's why I don't think that Singapore property market is a, is a good investment. Maybe you know, some growth market like Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, you know, uh, and some other markets, you will see some growth opportunity. But that in Singapore, I think those days are over. Mm, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Lou, at this time, I'm going to bring us back to CPF and um, maybe I can share uh, the pigeonhole and we'll refer to some of these uh, questions that we will be, uh, we have. So I'm going to open up the pigeonhole to share some of these questions. And um, the first ones will be mostly related to, you know, how to do the CPF. Uh, one is lump sum, you know, uh, in CPF away or SA. Uh, the second question is about lump sum, you know, to your HPP loan first or transfer some to SA or keep some in a way. How do you prioritize and allocate? So the first two, I think you can take kind of together. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think the very, it's very important to, to first establish what I think is a financial safety net hmm. before you go into a big time um, stock market. Now, if not, when the stock market goes up and down, like, you know, over the last few weeks, you know, your, your mood will go up and down. Now, so I always encourage young investors to first build a financial safety net in your CPF, especially in the SA. So I can't tell what you should do, but when I was young, very clearly, I threw everything I have right into the CPF or SA. So I fill it up, top it up first. Then I start dabbling with the stock market. It's easier that way. It's more safer, right? Now, could you have done it half, half? Yes, that's also one possibility, right? So, uh, three quarter, uh, and one quarter, maybe. So I would suggest you at least be in the process of building up a financial safety net in your O and SA first before you dabble, uh, into, into the stock market. Okay. So, so yes. So I think that's, uh, the first thing. Uh, second thing is that, um, I think for young people, it's very difficult to pay CPF, sorry, pay your HDB loans uh, with, with fully cash. So I would suggest that you should always try to pay your CPF loan with your, with your CPF initially. And as your income goes up, you know, you start changing more towards cash. Is it wise to redeem a HDB loan with your CPF? I, the answer I think is no. Because the CPF, uh, the CPF interest rate gives you a 2.5% return rate. 
And HDB loans out there are very cheap. It's, uh, I don't know, one and a half percent or so. So therefore, you actually, by not, by not paying up your HDB loan and putting money in your OA, you actually make a difference of, you know, between one to one and a half percent. And have you have the guts to put your OA into SA, that gaps widen. So by, by putting money in your OA, for, uh, you actually make 4% return and your HDB loan, you only paid 1.5. So you actually take a 2.5% difference. So, so that's why I always encourage people to be, to be wise in, uh, in the HDB, uh, 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 HDB or your housing mortgage. Okay. Can you address the, the number, the, this one, the couple who is earning a combined income of 9 to 10K? We're looking at PTO around 500 to 600K. Would it still be feasible advice to use cash to pay off the loan? Well, you are a fresh grad. Um, and I think it's difficult. Um, it's, first of all, not all loans are, are bad. Now, there are a lot of um, Chinese who don't like to borrow money. There's a lot of um, some religious group uh, who actually thinks that um, take, uh, taking loan is uh, against their philosophy. Uh, I don't think so. I think that is wise. Uh, if you could, it's the same thing, right? So I would suggest that if you have the cap, if you have the, the, the CPF, put it, uh, first of all, build a financial safety net, your 1M65 first. Then after that, spare ones, I would say, you know, either let leave it inside or put it into a S&P 500, let it compound. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you know, uh, use cash if you could to pay off your HGB loan. Now, if you can't, that means you, 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 you know, let's say HCB loan is, uh, is $2,000, right? You maybe want to use $1,000 for CPF, $1,000 cash or something like that, right? So, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's something you could mix and match. So I, I think I would, as much as possible, try, try to encourage people to max out the loan uh, as long as you can to take advantage of a low interest rate. Uh, and this third one that has come up is the now, you know, we get this quite a lot, right? You get this kind of question that people feel that they've missed out on top up opportunities to SA. They feel that they've missed out on investing their OA into, you know, S&P 500 or globally diversified equities to get, gain the long term returns that they could have generated. So there's a feeling that, oh, this is too late or I've missed out. Um, but this question, you know, well, how do you address this, you know, especially when our income is not too high, um, what should we do? Is it still something that we can do? Is there, you know, other hacks that you can share with us to do? Okay. The few things you can do. I used to think that, you know, now you're 33, 33 is very young. Okay. You can still do it. You know, yeah, 33 is about the time where I, where I start, uh, I, I started at 29. So between 33, 39, not much a difference. So I think it's it's okay, it's perfectly okay. Now your income is not high. If your income is not high, you know what? The few things you can do, right? Number one is work harder, right? Work harder. You know, do two jobs. You know, do a do a main job and do a part time job. Uh, you know, have multiple streams of income. Rent out your rooms in your HDB. You can do do a grab driving. You know, sell things on Lazada or or Carousel. There are many things you can do, right? So I think it's very important for everyone when you're young, to take advantage of your youth, to build up your portfolio, to let it snowball. Mm -hmm. Now, and I, I used to think that 40, 50 years old, maybe a bit too old, but I'm wrong. Because why? Because nowadays we have got presidents at 71 years old and prime minister at 90 years old. So the longevity of, of, of human is now much older. So it's okay, you know. Now, you may not make, you know, 4M65, uh, you know, but you could... Or even one M65. But what about half M65? It's still a lot of money, you know. It's still much better than, I don't know, 60, 70% of Singaporeans out there. So, so start, the, the time to do is to start as soon as possible, work as hard as possible, be as frugal. And for young people out there, you know, be, in, the, in that sense, work very hard, suffer when you're young, when you reach your 40s, you can enjoy a very easy life. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of questions and there's more below about robo-advisors, which is the bottom one here. Um, but also the first question you didn't like exactly answer is, you know, lump sum, place it in CPF or AOSA, should I use it to regularly invest through Endowas? So I guess, you know, we like to say that Endowas is not a robo-advisor because we most robo-advisors don't have robo. So there's no robot behind it. 
it's actually a human being doing it. Uh, and also they don't advise, they actually build product. So, you know, we don't like that word robo advisor. We just call ourselves a digital wealth platform um, and we provide advice for CPF investing, right? So, um, you know, just maybe you can share some thoughts about, you know, so many questions about robo advisors. Is it a good tool to use to regularly say, I mean, there's not too many good ways to regularly save. And so maybe these robo advisors or guys like Endowers can help you there, right? So maybe you can share about, you know, using robo advisors as an investment vehicle and then, you know, you know, lump sum question on CPF or ASA. Okay, I'll answer the CPF lump sum thing again. Yeah. Now, if you have $3,000 in cash right now, you know, go back to my, my first principle, make sure you have built up your 1M65 first. Mm -hmm. If you have not built up 1M65, you know, I would search, I, if I were you, I would put that into my SA first and let it compound. Not even endowers, not even S&P 500 can do 4% interest uh, uh, risk-free. It's a uh, risk-free returns are a 4% to 5%. It's very difficult to get, okay? So I think that's the first thing. Now, supposing you've done quite a lot of that, then what was, what would suggest you to do is that, you know, I would actually put the spare ones into uh, an S&P 500 uh, uh, engine and let it compound. So I would say that, you know, um, if you have got your 1S6 side built up, I would, I would, if I were you, I would put that into an S&P 500. The only, uh, the only company right now in Singapore that is permitted uh, is only endowers. So <laughs> that's why you have uh, the, 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 the only channel is to go through them. And, 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 and I would put money into endowers uh, and, and let, let, you, uh, uh, let the S&P 500 compound. Okay. Um, I cannot see the question screen. It's a, uh, I see oh, your no, face. That was it. That was, that was sorry. That, I just wanted you to, we'll come back to it. We're going to talk about okay. some other stuff, but oh, robo, robo advisors. And yes. Yes. Robo advisors. Yeah. I, I'll be frank. I don't exactly know what does robo advisor do the, because most like what you say, I don't see any roboing around. Um, most of it are human uh, behind it. So yeah, I don't, see. I don't see any roboing around. And so, uh, I think investment is, is investment really isn't that complicated that you need a robot to do it for you? Um, I think investment is more difficult uh, because of emotions. Yeah. So that part, I'm not so sure how Robo Roboing can help you, but I have a few things I that I'm always warn my always warn my uh, my one M six five fans. Number one is before you put money into a especially a finance a fintech a finance startup mm. you got to be careful where you put your money and yet most of it we don't put small money with them we put a lot of money with them there are companies that belly up this round and it costs a lot of pain to everybody so i would suggest it's very important for you to first verify the company the structure the safeguards to protect your money in the case on dowers i've you know they've got UOBK him behind them your money is part of UBKN. I think it's very difficult for UBKN to go belly up. Okay. So in, in, that's why I like this structure of endowers. I'm not so sure about the other robo advisors out there and, you know, especially the small ones. So I'm, I'm more skeptical. And I, as I said, I'm a risk adverse person. I want to be, I want to be careful and I want to protect everybody's interest. So I'll, uh, to, to directly answer it blatantly. You know, do your homework to find out who are the companies behind, who are the people, who are the founders, and what kind of uh, safety measures are there. You know, I'll be very, uh, be very, I will err on the on the safe side, right? So, so this is something I want everybody uh, to to be careful of. Yeah, Lou, Lou um, you mentioned that you wanted us to. Uh, sorry, I just share some slides on things like that and how we got into CPF. Um, is that something that maybe I should share or do yeah. you have any other questions that you wanted to ask me or in Dallas? No, I don't have a question for you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't obviously know. we talk all the time, Lou, but yeah. so about in Dallas and CPF investing, you said that, how did we get into, um, sorry, let me, I just explained this since Lou brought it up. Um, so basically um if you look at the difference when you invest your cpf is um there's a 35 percent limit for stocks 
um, 100% you can invest in these things. But the problem with CPFIS, I think, has been that cost has been really, really high. Um, so sorry, I'm not looking at the right slide. Is, is everybody oh, looking sorry, at the right? wrong, wrong slide, obviously. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I will share the right slide. There you go. Sorry about that. So um, you can see that, as I was explaining, SGX stocks is 35%, ETFs and other unit trusts are 100%. So you can build a portfolio, but it's costly. And that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of studies that CPFIS investing has been a poor experience because of the high cost. And so in Dallas is all about like reducing cost. So reducing and removing the sales charge, uh, removing the brokerage platform fee by introducing UOBK here as our partner, and then rebating 100% of the trailer rebates uh, to reduce the fund level fees down to almost half. So that all in costs are a fraction of what it would have been uh, beforehand. And you know what that means is that over the long term, it gives you a higher chance of success when you invest your CPFOA as uh, Lou highlighted. And this is the one that uh, Lou was um, asking about how we got uh, Vanguard, uh, the biggest, um, sorry, second largest, but the most uh, biggest mutual fund, retail mutual fund in the US uh, that does passive index investing. And it was sad to see that CPF did not have any passive funds available to it. Um, so we went and uh, worked with Gerard Lee at Lion Global, um, a big supporter and an amazing guy, um, and Vanguard uh, to build a Singapore dollar uh, product. So for Singaporeans. So a lot of there's a lot of questions on pigeonhole, Lou. So on the you know which vehicle to invest. You know, which S&P 500 to invest, you know, what is in Dallas different? And, you know, so I'm, I'll answer that together. Um, and so that that to, to, to that point, basically in Singapore is very limited ways to access even S&P 500, as Lou shared. And up to now, before in Dallas, there was no way of investing S&P 500 uh, through your CPF. And to answer another question, we actually uh, we completely agree with Lou that we should not touch us, uh, your SA. You should not invest your SA because 4% is an amazing risk-free rate that you can generate. And for the first 40,000, you can get 5%. That is amazing risk-free guaranteed rate. And you should take advantage of that. Um, but for your OA, which especially for the portion after the 20,000, that gets 3.5%. The remaining, which gets 2.5%, um, it's too low and it's not enough to build wealth over the long term. And so you should be investing in that. And I showed you the slide where I think, um, look, the possibility of you doing better than 2.5% if you put it into a balanced portfolio, um, over one year is 70% probability. Over 10 years is 85. If you invest long-term 15 years, it's 100% certainty that you'll do better than 2.5%. And uh, most people in Singapore will be investing for 20, 30, 40 years. And the other thing people forget is that you retire, you retire at 65, but that's when it becomes even more important to do asset allocation and investing right. Because from 65, you will probably have no or little income and you will live until 95. So that's another 30 years during which you're not going to just spend everything and die. You're going to live for 30 years to invest money well during that period is going to be critically important. So we worked really hard uh, to bring passive index funds into CPF. And um, it's not rocket science, Lou. It's been something that, you know, is available. We just, because we know finance, we know uh, the industry really well. And we went to the partners, right partners to work with them, like Lion Global and Vanguard. We were able to bring in uh, a passive S&P 500 fund. Uh, and we cut the fees tremendously. And we got 100% trailer rebates. And so the absolute cost all in is 30 basis points for the management fee and total expense ratio of 40 basis points. Um, so by achieving this cost versus what it costs in the retail market, CPF has allowed only in Dawas to be exclusively the provider of S&P 500 Vanguard fund. Uh, also, we just included the global equities fund, which is another wonderful passive product. Um, so that's how we did it. And uh, just wanted to share that. 
And as a result, it, it's in Sing dollars. All the other ETFs are in US dollars or euros or other currencies. So that incurs an FX cost. Um, and, you know, there's broker dealer cost. There's, you know, bid ask spreads, especially if you buy uses funds. And there's tax problems if you invest in the US um, withholding tax of 30%. S&P 500 gives us about 2% dividend yield. That's 60 basis points of cost uh, annually. And on top of that, there's potential risk of inheritance tax. Um, so if you use US ETFs directly, or if you use it through uh, robo-advisors at US UTFs, uh, then it's actually a very costly way of accessing it. So Indaos is the lowest cost way to access it. It's the only way to access it with your CPF money. But just to remind you, Lou, uh, for your SRS, it is available. It's you didn't tell me that. Huh? You didn't tell me that. You had told me that earlier. I would have saved that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's an odd charge you guys from. You're going to save money. I'll buy you a few more charge shoes for that. For that okay. mistake. But SRS and also even cash. Um, we have the same product. We rebate 100%. So uh, for cash and SRS, it is also the lowest cost way to access and cheaper than most ways uh, to access it overseas. Uh, you do it through Lion Global in Singapore, denominated in Sing dollars, and the cheapest way to access it. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, Lou, any other things that you want to maybe... Are there any more questions uh, from, our, from our audience? Um, so we have... Um, one more. So do you want to answer the, how does Mr. Lu teach Mrs. Lu about 1M65 or 4M65 now? <laughs> um, this is a very difficult question. So I think, I think very important is, first of all, you got to marry right. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm, Can I just I'm, say I, that B, uh, Lu's wife is an amazing lady, amazing businesswoman. And, um, you know, this is, they look like campus couple together. I don't know right. about that. Okay. <laughs> so I, I think it's important that, you know, you got to pick the right, uh, in terms of, I'm not talking about love and that kind of stuff, right? So okay. I'm talking about just financial. Okay? okay. So first of all, I think it's very important for you to pick the right, uh, spouse that you are at least financially aligned. Now mm. you can have different uh, opinion about how love life should be, but financially you need to be aligned. Now, in case you're not aligned, then in case you're not aligned, I would suggest you have separate accounts. Mm. That's the money. That's your money. You know, you at least don't let, uh, don't let your spouse uh, touch your money and you can manage your own money. Now, if you are financially aligned good, then you can manage the portfolio together uh, as one, as one family. That's even better. Now, the other one is, uh, is very important for you to inspire your children from young with the value of thrift, with the value of hard work, uh, the value of uh, investing uh, in the right right, uh, right place at the right time. So all this should be inculcated from young as well. And that requires you and your spouse to work together to inculcate the right values as a family. Now, your wife may have a different opinion how she wants to spend the money, but for the sake of the children, most, most parents would try to at least conform to some basic um, role modeling so that they would they would uh, make sure that the kids uh, will grow up uh, in the right way. So I think there's there's no right formula to it, but I think that's how I brought up my children, and that's how me and my wife have uh, have done uh, a part to 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 help in this financial um, journey. Um, I think we're a little bit over time, but maybe we can answer a couple more since there's so many questions. Um, Maybe about SA, uh, do you advise investing in SA? We answered it in a uh, slightly different, uh, we answered it both in different ways, but maybe just wrap that up. And then also, um, you know, he's a client, uh, somebody is turning 55. And uh, is it a good idea to use my SA for investment just before turning 55 so that the RA is transferred from OA instead of SA? Okay, so these are two different topics. Yeah. First, generally, you, do, you shouldn't touch your SA. It's not nearly impossible for any financial instrument out there in the market to beat your SA at risk-free at risk free returns, right? Nearly impossible. So I would suggest not to touch your SA at all and let just, just let it compound. Uh, second of all, I think what the person is referring to is what we call SA shielding, meaning that you, they park the SA out into some bonds, uh, that there is a transaction free. So the government will then, instead of transferring money from your 
SA to your RA, you transfer money from your OA to your to your to your RA. That as a result, then you have more money uh, that compounds at four to five percent or even six percent. So that is something we should do. Uh, in my one six side group, this is highly discussed. There's an article written by Lorna Tan uh, before she left uh, Singapore Press Holding yeah. uh, to DBS. Uh, I can send the article again. Join, yeah, join my. Yeah, the CPA hack. So join my group uh, in 165. I will set, I'll resend it and repost the article again. You take a look and all the instructions are inside. So uh, mm. please join my uh, 165 group. Thank you. And just on that 55-year-old question, um, there's another question who's asking, if you're in your early 50s, what can be done given that the investment time period is pretty short? Um, and that if you are investing at 55 question. Shifting to well, your, investing your... Uh, essay so that your OA is used for RA. That question. It, it, it's it's the same. It's the same thing. No. Generally, yeah. Generally, this is called a CPF. Uh, sorry, uh, SA shielding. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. And I yeah, it's a SA yeah. shielding question. It's it's almost it. But as a rule, regardless of whatever age you are, do not touch your SA for other investment. Okay. I think that's that's whether you are young or you're old, you should not do it at all. With the exception for this. Uh, SA shielding, and that's one off just before I hit 55 years old. Yeah. And there's a personal question that is asking about what, what will Mr. Liu do with the money he doesn't need? I don't have money that I don't need. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, nope. I, every cent of mine I have a plan for it, you know, even if I have to give a charity, that, that's, that's also a need, right? So I think that's sorry. maybe what he was asking. No, I think it's. Uh, I think it goes like now. I have a similar philosophy, like uh, Warren Buffett. I like to make money, right? I like the the money to snowball. Mm -hmm. At a certain time, the snowball will then have to be dispersed out. Sure, we want to park some money for our kids or whatever, and and I think that's important. Uh, then I would use uh, whatever money I have to to unwind the snowball into into courses that I think are are very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, there's a lot of a tremendous need in the society right now, um, so I think I think these are places I will start to unwind at, at the right time. Okay, I think uh, in the interest of time, we need to wrap up here. But um, first of all, I want to thank you very much for coming, Lou, and doing this for us. Um, also, want to express our gratitude and you know thank you for all that you're doing for Singapore, for the CPF board, all of the CPF members. Uh, please keep up the good work, uh, keep up the good fight uh, to help individual investors. Uh, Indawas will support you all the way because, you know, we are in it together uh, to secure the financial future and secure retirement for all Singaporeans. Um, and I just want to, like, allow you to maybe have some final comments and closing statements before we wrap up for today. Any final things you want to say or share to the group? So first of all, thank you, uh, Sam and Nandawas, for inviting me here. It's a great honor. Um, every chance for me to touch the lives of fellow Singaporeans, um, it's a great, it's a great um, thing that that you know we are working hand in hand together. Um, I and I think that you guys are doing a great job in in allowing CPF members to put money into S and P five hundred, and uh, and I think you know. I, I, as I say again, I, I think this is, uh, I'm not selling for your company, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful investment tool that, uh, that's available only to you. And I think you guys that have done a great job. So last and foremost, uh, this is a, this is a very turbulent time. I would say that it is also the first time in my investment life that I actually have fear. And the fear is not so much in losing money. The fear is more life and death for my family, for safety, and all these emotions are mingled together. And so, therefore, one has to really, number one, take care of your health, of yourself and your family. Number two, go back to basics in investment, okay? Mm. Go to basic investment, do the right thing, okay? And I think all of us will emerge fine. You know, we have a great government that has been very protective. And so, we've got to do our job do the right thing, stay at home, keep us hygienic. And finally, um, you know, do our part uh, in, in uh, protecting the, the society and ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. As we mentioned, I think fear is something that isn't very healthy for us, but it also helps us to do the right thing. 
Um, so thank you, Lou, once again. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Joining us tonight. Uh, stay thank healthy, you. stay safe, and please do what you can to you know support local communities. Mm -hmm. We're supporting Funki, our favorite char siu place today. Uh, it's grown cold, but um, Lou and I are going to hopefully enjoy that afterwards. Thank you, guys. Uh, have a wonderful evening. Goodbye.